Desperate times call for desperate measures. This is especially true for many of us in healthcare, as we find ourselves adapting to new roles and new units, innovating to tackle a new disease while adjusting to a new surreal reality. Hence, in an effort to reestablish some degree of normalcy, we decided to resume the release of our episodes on the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. As I say, the show must go on, and at least now you can listen to something that is non-COVID related for the next 20 minutes. I hope you enjoy this episode. This Neurocritical Care Society podcast is sponsored by Chiesi USA. Chiesi USA is dedicated to investing in research and development initiatives that deliver value-added medical solutions in cardiovascular medicine. Learn more at ChiesiUSA.com. That is C-H-I-E-S-I-U-S-A.com. Hey, podcast listeners, this is your host, Fawaz Mufti from Westchester Medical Center at New York Medical College, and welcome to another episode of the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. Nearly half of all physicians report being burned out, but the rates vary substantially with medical specialties. With neurology and critical care medicine taking the lead among medical specialties associated with the highest rates of burnout, of course, we had to dedicate an episode of the Neurocritical Care Society podcast to burnout. Working long hours won't necessarily burn us out, but getting too little sleep or feeling unappreciated might. And once we're burned out, we spiral into a vicious cycle of reduced work hours, relocation, depression, and even suicide. What's more is, nobody working in medicine is immune, and burnout can affect all members of the team equally. And this consequently harms patients because they lack empathy and make errors. And it usually takes more than a few yoga classes or going on vacation to feel like ourselves again. We're pleased to be joined by Taylor Purvis on behalf of the Neurocritical Care and Chaplaincy Study Group in Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Mike Brogan will discuss their recent publication entitled Burnout and Resilience Amongst Neuroscience Critical Care Unit Staff that was published in the Neurocritical Care Journal in October 2019. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, this is Mike Brogan. I'm a neurointensivist at Regions Hospital in St. Paul. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Taylor Purvis. We're going to discuss her recent paper in Neurocritical Care titled Burnout and Resilience Among Neurosciences Critical Care Unit Staff. Dr. Purvis, welcome to the podcast, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am an MD currently in my internal medicine prelim year in Connecticut, starting my anesthesia residency this July. And I did research as a a medical student at Johns Hopkins that was largely focused on how attending to the spiritual aspects of providers' well-being could influence their subjective experience of caring for patients. In particular, our research group was interested in exploring how hospital chaplains could be empowered to support clinical staff alongside their usual care of patients and families. And as we'll talk about today, I'm sure, an important part of supporting the clinical staff members involved better understanding the unique challenges that they faced in their daily practice. Burnout is a topic that is important to me personally as a practicing neurointensivist, but also as an ICU director when I think about patient care and experience and staff recruitment and retention. Can you give our listeners some background on burnout and resiliency in neurology and critical care? Absolutely. So important to define the terms that we're using. So burnout is really defined as mental physical, emotional impairment resulting from work-related stress. And related to that is this concept of resiliency or the ability to recover from challenges and endure those challenges. So burnout and resiliency are are kind of hot topics these days for good reason. As, As you know and the readers are aware, intensive care staff really face unique demands, so family decision-making, end-of-life concerns, issues of medical futility. And interestingly, the neurosciences critical care unit may be a particularly challenging work environment because you have high numbers of patients with brain death and, and high incidence of uncertainty regarding kind of functional outcomes, survival, and quality of life prognostication. And interestingly, as, as we were doing, kind of coming up with ideas for our research, we noticed that two, the two disciplines really scoring the highest in terms of physician burnout on surveys in the U.S. were among critical care providers and neurologists in particular. So we felt like this was a really important group to focus on. And 
of course, promoting resiliency and preventing healthcare staff burnout in general is important for the quality of patient care as providers with high levels of burnout are more likely to self-report suboptimal patient interactions. Tell us about the design for your study and the abbreviated modified burnout inventory used for those not familiar, as I was not. Absolutely. So our goal was to come up with a way to really report resiliency and burnout levels among our clinical staff in an academic center, NCCU, and to come up with, kind of try to identify the demographic variables that could impact the levels of burnout and resiliency. So we designed this cross-sectional study in which the study participants, this included NCCU faculty, nurses, nurse practitioners, and clinical fellows, um, and they were actually sent a 33-question survey designed to really get at these aspects of burnout and resiliency, and this took place over the course of about a year. The goal was to reflect people who had spent two or more weeks in the NCCU to try to get people who were really embedded in the environment for a longer period of time rather than, say, rotating residents. So the devices that we use to assess the burnout and resiliency, the burnout we use the abbreviated MBI, which essentially is a survey that is the abbreviated version of the MBI, which encompasses three subsections of burnout, emotional exhaustion, personal accomplishment, and depersonalization. And we had seen the survey used among, uh, in particular, rural-based medical practitioners, but it's kind of becoming a, a common way of trying to assess burnout in a little bit more of an abbreviated form than your usual MBI. And then as far as resiliency, we actually use the abbreviated CD risk, the Connor Davidson Resilience Scale, which is the CD risk 10 form, so 10 questions, and had been really validated among university students, kind of sociologic studies, and rehab inpatients. Um, again, trying to make this a more of a bite-sized survey that folks were more likely to be willing to complete. So we used the validated, abbreviated version. What were your main results, and were any particularly surprising to you? So our main results were that among NCCU staff, a longer time working in the NCCU was associated with higher emotional exhaustion in particular, that being one of the domains seen in the abbreviated MBI score. Our other main finding that we saw was that older age alone was independently associated with higher resiliency scores. So I should say, in our survey that we had, we had a majority of nurses answering the questionnaire, fewer fellows and kind of clinical faculty members. But it was very interesting to us that longer time working in the NCCU, so specifically comparing one to five years in the NCCU versus less than one year, was really independently associated with higher emotional exhaustion scores. What's so interesting about this is this finding appears contrary to other studies that we had read, which actually found that a longer time in the ICU was associated with lower levels of emotional exhaustion. So previous studies that we had seen said that the longer time you spend in the ICU, you're actually less, you know, have kind of lower amounts of reported emotional exhaustion. But what's interesting is kind of how this relates to our second finding, because our second finding was really that older participants had higher mean resiliency scores than younger participants. So on the one hand, it seems like these, these findings almost can't coexist. How can longer time working in the NCCU be associated with higher emotional exhaustion and older age be kind of associated with something that seems to be supportive, which is resiliency scores? But what's interesting is that age is not necessarily associated with higher emotional exhaustion scores. So it's really suggesting that it's the length of time spent in the NCCU itself rather than age or cumulative life experience necessarily that contributes to emotional exhaustion. So I think it's, you know, interesting findings, I think, in some ways makes sense that longer time working in the NCCU, being exposed to 
heavy workload, time pressure, years of stress caring for acutely ill patients and distraught family members really could have a cumulative impact on the state of NCCU healthcare staff. I also took note that there you saw a difference in emotional exhaustion between the physicians and advanced practice providers, NPs, and the bedside nurses, techs, and medical assistants. Any thoughts on that? It's interesting. So, yeah, so to, to summarize that again, that's perfect. It, a provider role really was associated with lower emotional exhaustion scores than a non-provider role. But interestingly, there was no really difference among kind of other categories. It was really this emotional exhaustion. I think when you're thinking about kind of the, the non-provider role, as we termed it, clinical technicians, nurses, medical assistants, you know, as much as we as providers can can kind of commiserate about the, the annoyance of, of paperwork and putting in orders and things like that, I think in terms of bearing a, the really the bring, being on the front lines of kind of encountering difficult families, families that are struggling with loss, seeing forming these bonds with patients because they're spending so much time at the bedside um, to have, you know, ch sudden changes in the patient's health or a death on the unit. I think it really speaks to how much the non-providers really absorb a lot of this, this impact and kind of emotional weight of what's going on day to day in the unit. Um, and so that, that for us was really helpful in terms of thinking about next steps. You know, who really needs to be the, the target for future interventions to prevent burnout and turnover in the, the ICU, especially in terms of the nursing staff. What were the main limitations to your study? So we had several limitations. You know, as, you, as you'll notice from reading the study, the majority of our respondents were in the nursing profession, white, female, so, of course, limiting generalizability to other populations who might be providing care for patients in the NCCU. And, you know, second, we hadn't asked participants whether they had previous experience working in other critical cares or palliative care settings prior to coming to the NCCU. So it's conceivable that folks, of course, who had previous work experience in these high-intensity care settings may have reported higher levels of burnout, even though it looked like they had spent very little time in the NCCU. And I've kind of learned on the job this year that that's actually quite common for nurses, especially with a robust clinical care training to move between units. So perhaps we, had, we didn't accurately capture that. And then, of course, kind of standard concerns about um, when you're measuring something deeply personal and, and something, something like burnout, resiliency, you, those most affected by burnout or those with low resiliency may be, in fact, the, the least likely to complete the survey. So perhaps our survey underestimates the true burden of burnout in our population. One of the things that came to my mind reading your study, when you look at the, the, the literature on burnout, uh, you also often see things regarding moral distress which is very common in critical care and in neurology, given the unknowns that we're dealing with. I would think that in, in future studies it would be ideal to have a measure of how much of that distress, that juxtaposition between the care you want to provide for a patient and their family and the constraints that prevent that, whether it's goals of care, communication, those sort of things. Absolutely. And it would be interesting to see, as we kind of, mentioned earlier about why would emotional exhaustion scores be higher among non-providers. I wonder if there is perhaps those in the so-called non-provider roles maybe don't feel like they have as much participation in those conversations with family members, with clinicians about what the, the goals of care should be. And perhaps they're kind of expected to carry out the results of these decisions and these conversations, but aren't really invited to be more active participants. So I can imagine that would be very, very distressing in a way that perhaps even the, the, the provider, so-called providers, are not really experiencing. But again, yeah, I think that's a wonderful point, and I would love to think about the best way to capture that moral distress, really the best way to, to quantify that and, or at least qualify it and, and, and study that. So where do you think we should go from here with the research on this? 
figure could potentially be uh, involved in providing direct care to staff members. And this is actually where our own research, this, this study led to us working on a study where we implemented a essentially a full-time chaplain in the NCCU, specifically providing care for clinicians and clinical staff like nurses. So that was where our particular interest is with this study. But I think on a, on a larger scale, really this is kind of pilot data to figure out how we can prevent burnout and promote resiliency among providers, in particular nursing staff. So some of the things we had talked about as a group was whether something like routine screening of staff at the beginning of employment might help us identify those who might be more at risk for burnout, potentially in, introducing for those individuals or even the group as a whole some interventions that have been shown in the literature to be helpful to decrease burnout. For example, professional coaching, which has been used in the kind of the education and healthcare sectors before. Small groups, of course, can be helpful. And then also mindfulness meditation for staff members could be a potential intervention. Of course, all these things take time away from your, your clinical responsibilities. And so it's important that we be cognizant of how we can really structure that in a, in a, in a productive way on the unit. But I, hopefully this kind of gives us some, some food for thought as to how we can really address this in real time and, and work to support our staff members better. I think that's definitely an excellent starting point. I've, I've done a number of things along the lines of stress management and resiliency training programs. Most of the interventions that you see hospital organizations putting out are really geared towards the, the staff members and less towards the process. And I wonder, are there things that we could do from the process of care standpoint that could help with this? Things like early involvement of palliative care, I, I like the idea of the full-time chaplain. We have benefited from having full-time chaplain in our unit. Any other things that you think might help with that? That's a great question. You know, the I think the for us, the full-time chaplain really addressed this issue. Like you said, getting palliative care involved early in conversations and also reducing barriers to asking for help. I mean, this is kind of the perennial problem in any any situation where someone's experiencing something that's that's kind of confidential or they deem, you know, a person thinks that they shouldn't complain about this at the risk of losing their job or being perceived differently by their team members. So this idea of having really a low barrier to asking for help or just asking for another opinion. And I think that's that was our idea about having the chaplain we were very mindful about this chaplain needs to be physically on the unit with a wide open door and like a shoe box where people could drop anonymous requests, you know, really so that you don't even have to pick up the phone or go downstairs or just anything to kind of reduce that barrier to asking and receiving kind of anonymous, judgment-free help. And I think that can be applied not just to staff members, but also to patients. And it doesn't necessarily need to be the reducing barriers to, to chaplains, but palliative care or social work or, frankly, any, anything in the hospital kind of just making it so that these next layers of care are easier to access um, or more automatic just to kind of at least make it a little more straightforward and a little, a little less difficult to receive that care. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Before we leave, is there anything else you'd like to add? I would just like to, to say thank you to all my, my co-authors, Dr. Saylor, and then also members of our chaplaincy study groups, including the chaplaincy department, as well as the wonderful members of the nursing team in the NCCU. Also, the American Academy of Neurology partially funded our research that we did. And I really want to thank you in particular for the opportunity to be on this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. The NCS podcast series is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, and advocacy in neurocritical care. Our production staff includes Fawaz Mufti, Lamani Balu, Mike Brogan, Josh Levine, Benjamin Miller, Storain Shepard, Jim Siegler, Sarah Sternezer, and Chris Zamet. Our senior producer is Bonnie Rousseau.
Our administrative staff includes Bonnie Rousseau and Angel Gindel. Music is created by Mohan Katapali from the Division of Neurocritical Care at the University of Miami. The NCS podcast series is available on NCS On Demand and wherever you may listen to your podcast. For more information, please follow us on Twitter at Neurocritical or on Facebook. I'm Fawaz al and thanks for listening. This Neurocritical Care Society podcast is sponsored by Chiesi USA. Chiesi USA is dedicated to investing in research and development initiatives that deliver value-added medical solutions in cardiovascular medicine. Learn more at ChiesiUSA.com. That is C-H-I-E-S-I-U-S-A.com.